Hey guys, how you doing? How's everybody doing? That's right. Okay, good. You know what? <clears throat> Pray, guys, by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the internet connection stays strong. I'm at my brother's place. You can see his internet is not too strong. And this is impromptu. I decided to do a live stream because I was on David Wood's channel. And then he said that he's probably going to have to shut down because the internet connection was bad in his hotel room. So I said, okay, maybe I'll just do a live stream on Christmas and be used with the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ and bless you guys. But at the same time, my uh, sister-in-law is here, so she's upstairs. And I don't want to be too noisy because, remember, I'm their guest. So pray that I'm a gracious and thankful guest, not take advantage of their hospitality, even though it's my brother and his wife and their family. See, I told you it's buffering. It's all right. What are we going to do? It's going to start buffering. Can you guys hear me? When you say it's uh, okay, but you can still hear me, right? Can you guys still hear me? Because you said you are very being you are being very quiet. Is quiet bad? Is the sound good? From one to five, how good is the sound? One to five, how good is the sound? Okay, yeah, I have to be quiet because I have to be a very respectful guest. Even though it's my brother's home, I have to respect him and my sister-in-law, not take advantage of their kindness. So pray for me in Jesus' name to find a place I can afford so I won't be a burden on anyone. Get on my feet, take care of myself by the grace of God's provision, take care of my daughters, and then I can have internet connection. <clears throat> That's strong, and I can go live as much as I want. So... I'm going to have to try to keep it at this level. I know you guys are shocked. But pray for the internet connection. It doesn't buffer. If Jesus Christ, our Lord, is pleased to use me to bless you on Christmas, right? So we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, bless this time. Bless this session. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we discuss the true meaning of Christmas. The celebration of the incarnation, the eternal word, the eternal son, God becoming man, being born as a babe from the Blessed Virgin for our salvation. Anoint this session, anoint the words of my mouth to speak truth without error, Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ and sanctify us, Father, purify our motives, cleanse us in the blood of Jesus. Enable me to speak passionately and clearly without stammering or confusion and bless your people to understand the things I'm about to say, Father, to speak the words that your spirit wants me to speak, to bless your people, to be strengthened by your Holy Spirit, empowered by your spirit, to know your word, to live your word, to love your word, to know you more intimately and love you more passionately, to know Jesus and love him more passionately, Father. Save us from distractions, save us from error, save us from confusion, Father, and please bless the connection so we can glorify Jesus Christ and be with our loved ones, be with my daughters, wash them in the blood of Jesus, seal them by your spirit and flood them in your love, Father. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yeah, all the Father, Holy Spirit. Now, if, I, if you see me get up and moving, I may have to move, but pray for the internet connection. Like I said, the internet here is not the best. It may buffer, but I want to talk about Christmas. I do encourage <clears throat> all of you to go back and listen to the last two previous sessions. Because the last two previous sessions, I was trying to prepare everyone for what I wanted to eventually discuss, Christmas. And I wasn't planning to discuss it today. I was planning maybe to do it on Friday, but I, I saw an opportunity. I said, okay, let me take advantage of it. The Christmas story. And again, I'm preaching to the choir. I know you guys know the story already. Hey, Sam, it's Judith. Hmm. There's a lot of Judas. There's even a canonical writing. <clears throat> when I say canonical writing accepted as scripture called Judith. 
So I don't know which Judith. Are you the Judith of the Deuterocanonical, the apocryphal work? Hmm. You got me discombobulated. Yes, I think, yes, 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 that's right. Now I remember, sister. Yes, you did. You sent me, yeah, you sent me an email. Judith from Whole Foods? You even have holes over there? Okay, anyway, don't mind my coffee-stained teeth. Let's talk about Christmas. I know people are still start celebrating Christmas. Hopefully we get all of David Wood's haters here. He had about 600, and he's boring as pits. Hopefully they'll come here, but let's talk about Christmas. As you can see, I like to focus on the core doctrines of the Christian faith. So let's talk about Christmas. You guys know the story of Christmas, but let's unpack the biblical basis for Christmas. And when I say Christmas, Christmas is meant to celebrate, not Santa Claus, celebrate the incarnation, incarnation, that the eternal word of the Father, the eternal son of the Father, the very heart of the Father, the love of the Father became flesh, a flesh and blood human being, our Lord Jesus Christ, took on a human nature, a physical body, tabernacled in the womb of his blessed mother. So Christmas is a celebration of the incarnation. Remember that. If someone tells you, what is Christmas? Christmas is the celebration of the incarnation. Now, as true believers, born of the Spirit, we celebrate Christmas every day. Every day we desire to celebrate the glorious coming of our God, of our Creator, into the world, condescending to be born as a human babe, becoming a flesh and blood human being for our redemption. So every day is Christmas for us. We worship the Lord Jesus Christ and thank Him and praise Him every day for entering the world and becoming flesh. But we also want to take this particular day, this particular day, because the world associates Christmas with Jesus Christ. And the world <clears throat> understands that the purpose of Christmas is to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. So we want to take this day and use it to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who may claim to be Christian but don't know the Bible, don't know Jesus, and to those who are not of the Christian faith. Now don't forget, Christmas may be over for some of you today, meaning this particular day, but January 6, January 6, Arminian Orthodox Christians will be celebrating Christmas on January 6, and then the Orthodox Christians will be celebrating Christmas on January 7. So it's not done. In fact, I know there are some Orthodox here joining the live stream. And they can confirm whether they celebrate on January 7. Uh, Niles guy asked me a good question. The Muslims would be hesitant, reticent to celebrate Christmas because... For the Muslims, they realize that Christians celebrate Christmas and that Christmas for them is the birth of the Son of God, the Savior of the world, God in the flesh who comes to die for our sins and to save us and reconcile us to the Father, to himself, not just the Father, and to the Spirit, right? That Jesus Christ our Lord is God in the flesh. So they would be hesitant to celebrate Christmas with us because they understand that Christmas is not simply the Christian recognition of the birth of a great prophet or the Messiah. They understand that for most Christians, at least true Christians, there are those who claim to be Christians, they're not. They're false Christians because they deny the Trinity or deity of Christ. They realize that for most Christians, Christmas is they're celebrating God becoming a human baby. And to them, that's blasphemous, right? I, could, I would not care to try to address objections against December 25th because to me it's a moot point. If someone wants to say Jesus isn't born on December 25th, that's fine. Notice what I said, Najim. Notice what my point was. And let me know if I'm boring you with this stuff because I want to get into what the Bible says about Christmas. I said even though you can make a strong case that Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, and yet there are those who make a strong case he was born on December 25th, it is irrelevant 
for me at least as a Christian, whether Jesus was born December 25th or not, what's relevant is that the world associates December 25th with the birth of Jesus Christ. Are you with me there? The world identifies this date as a celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. So then take that occasion, take this as an opportunity to proclaim to the world that this celebration is not just the celebration of a birth of a human prophet or a mere human Messiah or a great teacher, spiritual guide, but the birth of the creator of the heavens and, and the earth, that the creator of the heavens and the earth, the life giver, became a babe, a human being, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. So instead of trying to condemn it as a pagan <clears throat> date that was Christianized or condemn those who celebrate Christ Christmas or say, I don't use it as a tool of evangelism to reach the world who do identify this date with Jesus and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? Everyone with me there? In other words, use it as a tool of evangelism. If your personal conviction is that Jesus wasn't born December 25th, or wasn't born January 6th, or wasn't born January 7th, that's fine. But be smart. Be shrewd, wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove. Realize the world associates this date with the birth of Jesus Christ. Then be smart and use that as an occasion to proclaim to the world the gospel of Jesus Christ, who he is, the God-man, God in the flesh. All right? Is that clear? So I'm not going to get into a debate whether Jesus is born December 25th or not. There are strong arguments for and against, against that position. I'm going to take it as an occasion to celebrate the birth of the God-man, God who chose to become born as a human baby, to become a true human being for my salvation and his love for me, whose name is the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> so as to proclaim his glory to the world that does associate this date with his birth. Because to me and to every one of you, truly born of the Spirit, truly in love with Jesus Christ, Christmas is every day because every day we celebrate, every day we glorify, every day we praise and love and thank Jesus for entering this world and condescending to be born as a human baby, right? And I pray the Lord Jesus will be blessed with my meager efforts to glorify him, to bless this session and guide my discourse by the power of the Holy Spirit to bless you and strengthen you and to glorify him and to bring more people to listen in Jesus' name. Yehovah. Okay. With that said, let's get into the meat of the matter. Now, I'm going to build on the two previous sessions. If you have not listened to the two previous sessions, I encourage you that after this session, go back and listen because I did two in-depth sessions on who the wise men of Matthew chapter 2 truly were the Magi, and I connected them with the book of Daniel. And in the two previous sessions, I provided ample proof that the Magi would have known because of the prophet Daniel that the one born king of Israel was actually the God-man, God becoming flesh to rule as the king of the nations, to save the nations, whom all nations must worship as God, as the God-man. Now, I already gave the data, the evidence in the two previous sessions. So I'm not going to repeat that. I'm just going to continue from where I left off. But I'm going to encourage you again. Go back and listen to the two previous sessions because I connected the word that Matthew used in the Greek New Testament. Okay. Remember, the New Testament is written in Greek, Koine Greek. The word which the King James translators rendered as wise men of the East the word wise men is the word magi, magi. Now, the Greek translation of the book of Daniel, the Greek translation of the book of Daniel, used the term magi to describe that group of astrologers whom Daniel <clears throat> preached to, witnessed to, and ruled over. 
I'll give you an example. Daniel 5.11, real quickly. And thank Protestant for being here, and first and last, and I thank every one of you, because they helped me to help you to glorify Jesus Christ. Daniel 5.11. Let me just show you. Daniel 5.11. Okay, now read here. There is a man in thy kingdom, and whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, father light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods. Now pay attention here, guys. What's found in him? And Daniel, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Now notice what Daniel 5.11 said. Everyone, pay attention. It said that Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel the ruler, the master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Do you know the word astrologers was translated in Greek as magi? In fact, the first and last is here. First and last, can you get us the Greek of Daniel 5.11 so people can see with their own eyes that this class of, of <clears throat> astrologers that were functioning at the time of Daniel in the same palace with Daniel, whom Daniel ruled over, they're called Magi. Now, he's got the Greek here. If you follow along, you'll see what looks like an M-A-Y-W-N. Mayon, Magon, that's the word Magi. So folks, do you see that these astrologers are called Magi in the Greek translation of Daniel? So the Magi of Matthew 2 are the spiritual descendants of this group. The Magi of Matthew 2 are the spiritual descendants of this group. They belong to the same class called astrologers that were functioning, that were around at the time of Daniel. Why is that important? Why is that important? Because that tells you that the Magi of Matthew 2 came to worship Jesus as God, not just give him honor as a king, but they realized that this child who was born is God in the flesh, and they knew it because of their spiritual forebears, their spiritual ancestors, the Magi, were there at the time of Daniel. And Daniel, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, was told that the king of Israel would come, the son of man who rides the clouds, who approaches the Ancient of Days. This son of man is equal to the Ancient of Days in power, in glory, in essence. Because this son of man does things that only God can do and is worshiped as God. Now I covered that in the two previous sessions. Yeah, but it's not Magog. No, it's not Magog. Okay. So that means Daniel had already proclaimed, already taught and prepared <clears throat> the astrologers called Magi, the Chaldeans, the Kastim, uh, the soothsayers and sorcerers. He already proclaimed to all of them and revealed to all of them by the Holy Spirit in him that the king of Israel would come and all nations have to worship him as God in the flesh because that's who he is, the God-man worthy of all worship, and he's the king of all nations. So the Magi knew that, and the Magi were waiting for him. And so when Jesus was born, the Magi came to worship him as the God-man, that figure that Daniel <laughs> spoke of, who rules all the nations, the king of all the nations, whom all nations must worship as God. Now I went in depth on this particular topic in the last session. So go back and listen to the two previous sessions so you can get all the meat. If that's clear, I want to continue and build up, build on this theme. Are you ready for me to proceed? Are you guys ready for me to proceed? So far, are you with me? Are you focused by the grace of God? You're listening attentively, you're ready, and it made sense. So if someone tells you, did the Magi of Matthew 2 worship Jesus as God, or are they simply honoring him as a king? The answer is the Magi worshipped Jesus as God. Well, how did you know he was God? Because this is the same group. <clears throat> that was there at the time of them. When I say same group, not the same individuals, but this group called astrologers, this class, this study of astrology was a study that was being <clears throat> carried out by people even at the time of Daniel. 
So that means those astrologers that heard Daniel would have been told by Daniel, the true God of Israel is going to send a king. This king is a son of man. He's God in the flesh, king of all nations, and everyone must submit to him and worship him. So he had taught them, and then they taught each successive generation of astrologers. So those astrologers took what Daniel taught them, passed it on to the next group of astrologers, right, to their disciples, to their heirs, and they passed it on and passed it on, eagerly awaiting the fulfillment until the time came and that king of Israel, that son of man was born, who is the God man, the king of all nations, who is worthy of worship. That's how we know that they're worshiping him as God in the flesh. Is that clear? Because of the prophecy of Daniel. Uh, I for Christ. Are you even listening to what I just said, brother? Or why was I wasting my time on you? Notice what I for Christ just asked me. Did the Magi know the prophecy in Daniel about Jesus? Brother, did you just listen to what I just said? I just said the Magi are the spiritual heirs because they are part of that same group of astrologers that was functioning in the time of Daniel. So, brother, why would you ask me, did they know about the prophecy of Daniel? Folks, please make sure you are listening and ask me to repeat a point if you're not getting it, because I'm not going to rush through this. I want to take my time slowly unpacking the meat of Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit, trusting the Holy Spirit to illuminate us, to understand the things of Scripture and live it out for the glory of Jesus. Everyone with me? Are you focused? Just want to make sure. I'm going to give you supporting evidence that the Magi were worshiping Jesus as God in the flesh. Further proof. Let's go to Matthew 2.11. Matthew 2.11. Okay. Matthew 2.11. Hopefully it's not lagging, not buffering. There's a difference between buffering, meaning, you know, when you say lagging, buffering, and by the time what I say reaches you. Matthew 2.11. Here, read with me. And when they, they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, okay, pay attention, opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts. They gave him gold, right? Gold is a tribute you give to a king, so they know he's royalty, because they even said he's the king of Israel. And frankincense and myrrh. Folks, do you see the three gifts that they gave to Jesus our Lord? Rin Tin Tin. I think you need, you need to be blocked, because I don't think you're getting it. Okay. Okay, now, gold is what you give as tribute to a king. Are you with me there? Gold is what you give as tribute to a king. And they already recognize he's the king of Israel because they said they've come to worship the king of Israel. That word frankincense, frankincense is the incense that the priest offered in their sacred service to God. Did you know that? Frankincense. Okay. The word is Lebanus. Lebanos, but here it's an accusative. It's Lebanon. Here, let me show you. Let me get you the Greek. In fact, can you quote the Greek uh, for me? First and last. Notice they offered the Lord Jesus Christ frankincense. Frankincense. They gave God's fragrance to him. Yep. Now here, notice Matthew 2.11. The last sentence, it says, Ke Lebanon. K. Smyrnan. Do you see that? Lebanon? Lebanon. From Lebanos. Lebanon. Frankincense. This same word is used in the Greek translation of Leviticus chapter 2. The Greek translation of Leviticus chapter 2. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. I think Abby George needs to be sent on his merry way. 
Uh, and if I'm saying Lebanon, what is, do you want me to send you there too, Daniel? Would you like to visit Lebanon right now? Leviticus 2, 1 to 2. And when any will offer a meat offering unto Jehovah, his offering shall be a fine flour, and ye shall pour oil upon it and, and put frankincense thereon. Do you see that word? Frankincense? Leviticus 2, verses 1 to 2. When you offer meat offering unto Jehovah, his offering shall be a fine flour, shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. Frankincense. Guess what the Greek translation of that word is? Libanun. Libanun. Verse 2. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take thereout his handful of the flour thereof and the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof, and the priests shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made of fire of a sweet savior unto Jehovah. Did you guys see it? Do you see the word frankincense used? Do you see the word frankincense used in Leviticus chapter 2 verses 1 to 2? And first last just posted the Greek. It's the same Greek word of Matthew 2.11. The same Greek word of Matthew 2.11, he just posted it, Libanun, 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 Libanun. Did you guys catch it? So when the wise men are offering to Jesus Christ frankincense, they're offering him what the priest offered to the true God, the true God. So far, are you with me? Leviticus chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Leviticus chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. However they want to spell it, superfluous, the Greek is in front of you. It's Libanun. Libanun. Now, obviously, I'm butchering the Greek pronunciation. That's fine. Now, notice Leviticus 2, 15 and 16. Notice, folks, there's that from word frankincense again. And thou shalt put oil upon it and lay frankincense thereon frankincense thereon hmm that word frankincense it is a meat offering verse 16 and the priest shall burn the memorial of it part of the beaten corn thereof and part of the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof it is an offering made by fire unto jehovah did you catch it frankincense guess what the greek word for frankincense is when this was translated into greek that word, the Hebrew word for frankincense, and here it is. Thank our brothers, Protestant and First Last, for serving me to serve you. Frankincense, and he just put the Greek, it's Libanun, Libanun. You see it in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 15? First Last just posted the Greek of Leviticus. Libanun, there you go. And verse 16, here it is, ton Libanun. Right? And then in verse 15, right, it's an arthris, meaning without the article. It's auten, auten, li, sorry, I'm buffering. Notice in verse 15, it's an arthris. Without the article, it's libanun, liban, right? You guys getting it? Do you see? I see it. I know I'm buffering, so just be patient. In Jesus' name, by his grace and mercy, it'll go smooth. So did you catch it? In verse 15, it used the word Libanun without the article, anarthris. In 16, it used the definite article, right? So before I move on, did you guys see that the frankincense which the Magi offered to the Lord Jesus Christ is frankincense that the priest offered to the true God in their sacred service to the true God of Israel. No, it's not in Hebrew. It's in Greek. Libanun is the Greek transla translation of the Hebrew word for frankincense. Okay. So do you understand the implication of this? I don't know if you're understanding this. Thank you, Rolf. Thank you. They offered him gold, which is the tribute you give to a king, recognition that he's royalty. They even call him the king of Israel. But then they offered him frankincense, which is an offering to God. Offering to God. 
which means they recognize he's God in the flesh. He is incarnate deity, God enfleshed in a human body. Right? Did you catch it? Is it making sense so far? Before I move on. But they also offered him myrrh. You know what's interesting about the word myrrh? It's the word shmyrna. I believe it's an accuser of Shmyrna. Shmyrna is where we get the word for that city, Smyrna. Myrrh. Myrrh. But here's what's beautiful. That word, oh, by the way, another place where Libanon is used, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6. Isaiah 60, verse 6. Sorry about that. The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of Jehovah. Folks, guess what the Greek word for incense is? Now, this is written in Hebrew, folks. This is written in Hebrew. But when they translate in Greek, guess what the word incense is in Greek? Libanon. But did you catch what it says here? It says, those from the east will come and offer gold and incense to the God of Israel as a sign that the God of Israel is the true God who fights for his people. And that's exactly what these wise men of the east did. They brought gold and incense. You just read it, Isaiah 60, verse 6. Right. You see it? And then do you see the word Libanun ke Libanun? It's right there. Isaiah 60, verse 6. Did you catch it? They will come from Sheba, right? And these places to give gold and incense in acknowledgement that the God of Israel is the true God who saves his people. And yet these wise men from the east, they brought gold to Jesus and incense to him, frankincense. And do you see in the Greek? Can you post the Greek again, first and last, so they can see that the Greek is Libanun, Libanun? Libanun? i got to do something. Hold on. You guys see it? Do you see that the Hebrew word translated incense and Isaiah 60, verse 6, is translated in Greek as Libanun, Libanun, the same word in Matthew 2, 11. Cameron. Do you see it? Okay. Did it sink in before I move to the next part? That by giving Jesus Christ, the child, frankincense, this was a sign that they truly understood that the child before them is the God child. God Almighty, who had become a child to rule as king of Israel and therefore worthy of their worship. Is it clear? But they also gave him something else. What did they give him? They gave him myrrh. They gave him myrrh. Let's see why that's significant. Post Matthew 2.11 again. And guys, in case you want to see what the Greek is for Matthew, here's the link. Here's the link to the Greek. Here it is. Interlinear. And Matthew 2.11. They gave him myrrh. Notice it says, And when they had opened their treasures, when they had opened their treasures, and I'm waiting for the second part of the verse, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, if you click on that link that I gave you, interlinear, you'll see it says, Ke Smyrnin, Smyrnin, which is from the word Smyrna. Okay? okay. Now, why is this important? Let's see why this is important. This word myrrh is used in John 19, 39. So let's read John 19, 38 to 40. John 19, 38 to 40, same Greek word. 
use in John 19, 39. But let's read John 19, 38 to, 30, uh, to 40. And if you don't believe me, here's the link. Here's the link. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Now, I have no idea why he skipped verse 39. I don't know why he's giving me 40 to 42 either. I don't know which part of John 19, 38 to 40 wasn't clear. Yeah, poor Ed. And he wonders why I give him our time. I go John 19, 38 to 40, and he goes from 38, skips 39, and goes 40 to 42. Okay, let's do this again, Ed. John 19, 38 to 40. Yeah. What a good name, Piggy Muslim. You are a filthy swine, filthy scum of the devil. John 19, 38 to 40. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea, read with me. Being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pay attention. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Notice 39. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh. There goes that word, word again, myrrh, same word of Matthew 2, 11, and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? There's the link. Notice the same word Smyrna used in Matthew 2.11. Matthew 2.11, where they gave Jesus myrrh, is now used here in John 19.39. The only other time this word is used in the Gospels, it's used in John 19.39 in reference to the myrrh that they used to embalm the body of Jesus or to prepare the body of Jesus for burial. You guys see it? Do you see the Greek word? It's smyrnus, right there, smyrnus. You guys caught it there? I'm, I want it to sink in before I move on. I just want to make sure everyone got it. Gold they gave to Jesus, tribute to a king, and they knew he was a king. He's the king of Israel. Frankincense they gave to Jesus, which is what priests give to God and their sacred for service to God, showing they recognize he's the God man, that that child is the God child, the God babe, God who chose to be born as a human baby, who becomes a human child and then a human adult. But then they also gave him myrrh. Myrrh as a signification of his death. You understand this shows you that the Magi knew a lot more than you thought. They knew the king of Israel is not just the king. He's God in the flesh who would die. You understand? They knew he is the God man, the God babe, the God child, God who becomes born as a human being to rule as the king of Israel and the king of nations. And as the God man, he's worthy of worship, but he would also die. Now, I made the connection in the two previous sessions that they would have known that he is God in the flesh because of the prophecy of Daniel, right? Now, how would the wise men know, how would the wise men know that this God man would also die because of Daniel again? Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. So the Magi provides indirect attestation that Daniel 9, 24, 27 is a prophecy of the Messiah, the ruler being cut off, being killed in order to bring about atonement and salvation. Let's read it. Let's read it. So many weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So in these 70 weeks of years, 70 times 7 years, 490 years, this is what God is telling Daniel through the angel, 
This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. <clears throat> transgression will be ended. To finish transgression, an end of sin. To make an end of sins. To make reconciliation for iniquity. So during this 70 <clears throat> weeks, 70 times 7. Weeks here means a week of years, 7 years. So 70 times 7. 490 years. During this 490 year period, God is going to accomplish the following. He's going to accomplish all of this in this 490 year period. He's going to finish transgression, put an end to sins, make an end of sins. He's going to make reconciliation for sins, meaning our sins have separated from, from God, severed us from God, and God is now going to remedy that. Not only that, but during that 490 years, he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. And then he's going to seal up vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. Now, let me explain the last two parts. Seal up the vision and prophecy means in these 490 years, he's going to bring about the fulfillment of all the prophecies made. The prophecies that have been made will be sealed, meaning fulfilled and completed. Anoint the most holy. Either that means the holy place, the temple, or the holy one. During this 490-year period that God has decreed, the most holy shall be anointed. Is there one following what God attempts to accomplish in those 490 years? You understand what you just read? God telling Daniel through the angel. God through the angel tells Daniel, in this 490-year period, 70 weeks, meaning 70 times 7 years, a week of years, and how many days in a week? Seven. But that week represents a week of years, not a week of days. So 70 times seven years and 490 years, the starting point of which will be the decree that Daniel will mention. All of these things God will accomplish. All of these things. Okay. Now, let's read Daniel 9, 25 to 27. So I just want you to see that the prophecy explicitly, directly connects <clears throat> this period of 490 years with God, abolishing sin, fulfilling prophecies made, bringing in everlasting righteousness and reconciling people to himself who had been cut off because of their sins. Okay? Clear, right? Now let's read Daniel 9, 25 to 27. Let's read. Know, therefore, understand that from the going forth of the commandment, from this commandment, this decree, will be the starting point of the 490 years. This was the starting point. This decree, this commandment, will be issued to restore and to build Jerusalem. From the time of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and restore it until the appearance of the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, meaning from the time the decree is made to rebuild Jerusalem, until the appearance of the Messiah, the Prince. Notice the Prince also can be translated as ruler. Mashiach Nagid, ruler. There's going to be seven weeks, seven times seven years, and 62 weeks. 62 times seven years. So do the math. Seven times seven, that's 49 years. 62 times seven is how many years? 434 years. So if you add 434 to 49, 483 years, it's going to take 483 years from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to the appearance of the Messiah, the Prince. But what's going to happen to this Messiah, the Prince? And after the 62 weeks, three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, will be killed, will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end... Let's read it. And the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, I'm not going to impact the entire timeline, because that's not... 
important for this session. What is important for this session is understand that part of the prophecy that God gives to Daniel, I've decreed 490 years. The first 483 years, right, will bring about a decree to restore Jerusalem and also the temple to the coming of the Messiah, the ruler, to the Messiah being cut off, being killed. And after he's cut off and killed, the temple and the city destroyed. Folks, can I ask you a question? Historically, when Daniel's writing this, the second, the first temple had been destroyed and Jerusalem had been destroyed. He says that Jerusalem will be rebuilt, temple will be rebuilt, Messiah will appear, who's the ruler. He'll be killed, cut off, and then the temple and the city will be destroyed again. Historically, has that happened? Has there been someone who came claiming to be the Messiah, the ruler, who was then killed and cut off, and then afterwards the temple and the city destroyed? Lord willing, in the near future, I'll do a series on unpacking Daniel 9, the timeline of Daniel 9. Okay, now, if Daniel is prophesying that the Messiah, who is the ruler, will be killed and cut off, and the same Daniel also prophesied that the son... Okay, am I buffering still? Okay, my buffering still. All right, sorry guys. This is the best we can do. Okay, let me repeat again in Jesus' name, by His grace and mercy, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me repeat again. If Daniel prophesied, the Messiah ruler will eventually show up, be cut off, be killed, and after he's killed, he's cut off. The temple will be destroyed and the city. And if Daniel also prophesied that the Son of Man who is the Messiah, because the Son of Man is the King of Israel, is actually God in the flesh, who rules the nations forever, whom all must worship, then it only makes sense that the Magi knew so much about Jesus, the King of Israel, because they would have known from Daniel that the King of Israel is that Son of Man, the God who becomes human, the God who's born as a babe, to rule the nations as the King of Israel whom all nations must worship, but still would have to experience a violent death because he is that ruler that Daniel would said would be cut off, would be killed. Right? Everyone got it? See, the demons are manifesting, but we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit. So do you see how much the Magi really knew about Jesus? If you connect them with the astrologers of the time of Daniel. You with me there? If you understand that Matthew, in naming them Magi, wanted his readers to see that this is the group of astrologers whose roots go way back as far back as the time of Daniel, because the astrologers of Daniel's time, whom Daniel ruled over, they are called Magi in the Greek translation, which means Matthew's Greek readers would make that connection if they knew Daniel. Oh, wait, the Magi. Wait, wait, they were Magi at the time of Daniel. Oh, no wonder they knew so much about the Messiah. That's why they knew so much about the Messiah, because the Magi, this group of astrologers, have been around for a long time, as far back as the time of Daniel, and Daniel ruled over them. And Daniel had the Holy Spirit in him, revealing things that even blew away the minds of the king and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans in the king's palace. And they all recognized Daniel was truly the servant of the true God, whose God alone reveals mysteries and had revealed them to his servant Daniel by the Spirit. So if anyone tells you, what proof do you have that the Magi were worshiping Jesus as God? I've given you plenty of proof, not just in this session, 
but in the two previous sessions. You with me there? If you go back and listen to the session before this and the one before that, I laid the foundation, making a case. So they knew Messiah is the God-man worthy of worship, but they also knew from Daniel, they also knew from Daniel, Messiah would be cut off and killed, which is why they gave him myrrh, meaning they recognized the vicarious nature of his death, meaning they knew his death would bring about their salvation. His death would bring about their everlasting righteousness. His death would bring about the end of iniquity. They knew that because of Daniel. And so they trusted in him and hoped in him to not only be their king, not only their God who became man, worthy of their worship, but their savior from sin. Yeah. Yes, Ron, of course they were. Why did they come to worship him? Is it sinking in? Are you guys getting it or no? Did it sink in? And by the way, if you had listened to my first session, I also destroyed a lot of Christian myths. Number one, they weren't three magi. The text doesn't tell us there were three. The reason why people think there are three is because they gave three gifts. So that myth has to go. It wasn't three magi. And go listen to the first part of the session for the details. The second myth, number two, the Magi, I just said they're not three kings or three wise men. The person repeats three kings. In fact, Mr. Snuffleupagus, show me where it says they were three kings or three wise men. The second myth that needs to be destroyed, the Magi did not show up in the manger. When they came to Jesus, Jesus wasn't a baby. He wasn't in the manger. When they came to Jesus, Jesus was already living in a house, and he was at least two years old. Okay, so you, you got me confused, Mr. Snuffleupagus, Esquire. Okay, did you know that? When the wise man Magi came to Jesus, he wasn't a baby just born from his blessed mother, and he wasn't in swaddling cloths, and he wasn't in a manger. By the time they reached him, he was at least two years old, and he was living in a house with his mother. Yeah, exactly, Orthodox defense. Justin Martyr says, the tradition is he was born in a cave. Yes, you with me there? Did you guys understand that, right? Exactly, Charles Dickens. Luke 2, 8 to 15 says, the shepherds came to the baby in swaddling cloths in a manger. But the wise men wasn't there. And if you want proof that when the wise men saw Jesus, he was about two years old and living in a house, let's read Matthew 2. Let's read 11 <clears throat> all the way to 15. Matthew 2, 11 and 15. Exactly jumping like a monkey. That's what I said in the previous session. Exactly, brother. Okay. And... When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Now, guys, pay attention. Read with me. Frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Pay attention, folks. Do you want further proof that the Magi were true believers who worshipped the true God of Israel and knew because of Daniel's revelations that the King of Israel is truly in the flesh, the God-man worthy of their worship? If you want further proof, did you pay attention to verse 12 and 13? 
God spoke to them in a dream in a similar way. Okay, you want further proof? Notice Matthew 2, 12 and 13 again. Matthew 2, 12 to 13 again. God spoke to them in a dream in a similar way <laughs> to <clears throat> God speaking to Joseph in a dream. Did you guys see it? Matthew 2, 12, 13. God spoke to the wise men in a dream just like he spoke to Joseph in a dream. In other words, like Joseph, they're receiving revelations from the true God. Here, look at it, Matthew 2, 12, 13 again. Let's look at it one more time. Watch here, Matthew 2, 12 to 13, pay attention. Let's see, we're just waiting for it, yeah. We're waiting for Protestant. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to her, they departed into their own country another way. Now, who spoke to them in a dream? God spoke to them in a dream, revealed to them in a dream what not to do. But now notice 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. So like Joseph received revelations from God in a dream, they too received revelations from God in a dream. Fred, when you ask me that question, it makes me want to give up teaching or block you. You're joking, right? When you ask me that question, Fred, you're kidding, right? I feel like giving up on teaching because of that question or blocking you. You mean all this information I gave you that the Magi knew that the King of Israel is God and they came to worship him. You mean they had to wait till they found Jesus to believe in him? So can you answer the question for me, Fred? Why in the world are they looking for the King of Israel to worship him if they already did not believe in him? Man, I may not be cut off for teaching, man. I probably need to find another line of work. Okay, so Fred, if you miss part of the, send Kevin out of here. Get him, get him out of here. Get him. I don't want to hear this guy. Get Kevin out of here, Kev920. Fred, if you heard part of the live stream, why are you chiming in, brother? Why are you disrespecting me and everyone else? By then asking a question when you haven't heard the entire live stream. Why do you guys do that? Why would you guys come in the midst of a live stream and interrupt everything by asking a question that had you listened from the beginning, you would have already known the answer? Send J Jimmy Fernando around, uh, around some other town. I told uh, David Wood to really make those shirts. I've been blocked by Sam Shamoon because it's going to go viral. We're gonna sell millions of those shirts especially to the ones who have been blocked by me. They'll be the first to buy it, then I'll, I'll autograph it. Uh, Daniel Harp, I think you think you're perfect, so I think I need to send you on your mate, merry way too. Yeah. Okay, so everyone want me there? Everyone get it? Okay. For those of you paying attention, did you see God spoke to the wise men in a dream like he spoke to Joseph, right? That means the wise men received revelations from the true God in the same or similar way to Joseph. That means for them to have the true God revealing himself and his will to them in a dream like he did Joseph shows that they are true believers who worship the true God whom the true God made himself known to. Did you guys catch that part? Thank you, Southern California. How do I know Jesus was at least two years old when the wise men found him? 
Because notice it says, they found the child and his mother in a house, not in a cave, not in the manger, Matthew 2, 11, right? But how do I know he was at least two years old? Now let's read from 16 down to 23. We're not going to read all of it, but Matthew 2, 16 to 23. Yeah, even the Torah did not have all this information, my own website. These details are found in subsequent books written after the Torah, specifically in Daniel. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof from two years old and under. Did you guys catch it? according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Did you catch what it just said? Herod ordered the slaughter of all male children two years and younger, according to the calculation of the time <clears throat> of the wise men. Did you guys catch it? Two sixteen. you see it? From two years under, according to the time, which he had diligent inquired of the wise men. So, folks, can I ask you a question? If Jesus was an infant, an infant in swaddling cloth, why then order the slaughter of male boys to and under? Why not just say, look for every male infant you find and kill him? You get it now? Do you understand now, the play reading of Matthew 2 shows Jesus was at least two years old, living in a house, when the wise men found him. He wasn't a baby in a manger in swaddling cloth. The shepherds found Jesus as a baby in swaddling cloth in a manger, not the wise men. The wise men did not appear with the shepherd, contrary to cartoons or movie depictions or manger scenes. The wise men came later when Jesus was about two years old, living in a house in Bethlehem. Clear? What's well, not only the most logical, I'm, I'm showing you from Scripture. I'm showing you from Scripture what the Scripture teaches. So did you see that there's ample, ample evidence? Ample evidence that the wise men knew a lot about the God of Israel and were worshipers of the God of Israel, believers of Israel, and knew that the king of Israel would be in the flesh, the God-man, God being born as a human baby, a human child, to become a human being, to rule as king over the nations, whom all nations had to worship, and who would die vicariously. They knew about Jesus Royalty, deity, vicarious death. And the three gifts show that the two, Jesus is royalty because they knew he's the king of Israel. They gave gold to honor his royalty. They knew he's God, which is why they gave him frankincense. And they knew he would die, which is why they offered him myrrh. Mary, did you know? You know what's killer? It's a, you have these Mohammedans, stone worshippers who follow a pedophile, woman raping, woman whoring prophet, who try to pretend to be intelligent and pass themselves off as apology. I don't know what you mean. Can I repeat? Uh, what? I don't get some repeat what? More than once. Okay, hopefully it doesn't buffer. Najem, I spent about 10 minutes explaining the significance of myrrh. What do you want me to repeat a point that I've already elaborated on for 10 minutes? Have you been listening, Najem? You've been here from the beginning. 
Hmm? And if you were listening, Najam, just to test you to see if you're listening, I said that that word for myrrh, smirnas, where we get the word smyrna, appears only one other time in the Gospels. Where does it appear? Okay, Najam. Where does that word for myrrh appear? It appears only one other time in the Gospels. Does anyone remember? I want to see who's paying attention. Send Rob Rod Rodriguez somewhere else. Maybe needs to take to put. Yeah. Do you got for? Uh, yeah. That the word superfluous just said in Matthew for myrrh appears only one other time. In the Gospels, where else does it appear? Superfluous pastry. All righty then. John nineteen. Oh. All righty then. Yeah. Okay, buffering real bad. I don't know if it's okay now. Is it okay now? I don't think so. Hopefully it's okay now. Okay. 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 Is it okay now? Okay. Yeah, you guys got it. Okay, you guys got it. The word in Matthew 2.11, where we get the word appears all other time in the Gospels in John 19.39. Do you remember that? You guys, most of you remember. John 19.39. Send me on Mary Blackstone. Yeah, all righty then. Mm -hmm. All righty then. Yep, I don't know. If it's going to buffering, I'm going to shut down. Uh, if it keeps buffering, folks, yep, I'm going to shut down. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it keeps buffering. If it keeps it up, I'm just going to shut down. Right. Sorry about that, folks. This is technology for you. I don't know if it's back. I did try a low, lower resolution. I don't know. I'm scared. I'm actually scared to continue because I'm thinking it's going to buffer. Yeah. Well, that's your end. It's pretty bad because you're in Southern California. So hold on. Uh, TP, TM Cross, let me restart my internet to lose the connection and lose the live stream because... You restart the internet. Yep, that's that's good thinking, brother. That's like, yeah. Here, let me repeat that advice again. I love it. Uh, Sam, restart your internet. Wait, but if I restart my internet, I'm going to lose the lives, lose the connection. Yeah, wonderful advice. Oh, that was, yep. Yeah. Yeah, really, wow. <sighs> Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Oh, everyone with me, though? We're getting it so far? Is it making sense to everybody? Because the buffering was real bad, so there was a delay. Okay. Did everyone see that the word myrrh, smyrnas, used in Matthew 2.11, is used only one other time in the Gospels, and it's used in John 19.39? If you read John 19.30-40, 
39 says that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus got myrrh with them because they were going to, quote unquote, embalm the body. It's not embalming, right, so much, but it's, you know, preparing the body for burial. So they used the myrrh to prepare the dead body of Jesus for burial. Burial where? In Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, right? Do you remember that? John 19th that the wise men by the grace and mercy of Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit filling us and covering us with the blood of Jesus and filling us in Jesus name bless the connection Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name yeah, Lord, bless the Spirit. that tells you that the wise men knew that the king would die but they also knew he's God in the flesh which is why they gave him frankincense they also knew he's the king of Israel therefore worthy of tribute so they gave him gold and I gave you the reason why they would know so much, right? Because the Magi is the term used in the Greek translation of Daniel to refer to that class of astrologers that were there at the time of Daniel, whom Daniel ruled over and revealed to them the true God of Israel and the true God of Israel's plans for the future. Right? Is that clear? Did that sink in before I move on to the next point? In Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit. May you save us from error, confusion, from stammering, from misinterpretation. Crucify our flesh, destroy our flesh, and fill us with fruit and life and love and power from the Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, Father, beloved Son. Okay. Just want to make sure. Okay, now, with that said... Guys, if you're wondering why I can't speak louder, it's because my sister-in-law is upstairs. I don't want to disrespect her. It's her home until I get my own place. Then I can be loud and scream and insult you with greater fervor. Okay. So with that said, if you go back and listen to the two previous sessions along with this section, you will see clear evidence. The Magi knew the true God, were worshipers of the true God, and knew by revelation that they would have received from their spiritual forebears, which they received from Daniel, that the king of Israel, the Messiah, is the God-man, God who becomes flesh, the God-man, worthy of worship as God, who would die vicariously. They knew all that. They believed all that. And to show their belief, they came <clears throat> to worship him as a sign. We've been waiting for him. <clears throat> Now that he's come, we give our allegiance to him because he is our God, our Savior, our King. Right? Clear? Now, as a side note, where did Joseph of Arimathea bury Jesus? In his tomb, right? Sepulchre? Sepulchre. Sepulchre. And that sepulchre was located where? Does anyone remember? That sepulchre was located where? Where was it located? I know it's in Jerusalem. That's not what I'm saying. Does anyone know its exact specific locale? It's in Jerusalem, but where? Who knows? Someone tell me. Anybody know? Anyone know? Anybody? John 1940. John 1940. Sorry about that. I'm getting distracted. John 1940. Yep. Yagui got it. Yagui got it. And Jojo got it. Yagui and Jojo. Yeah, baby. You guys got it. Come on, John 1940, Protestant believer before the rapture. We don't want to leave you behind. Then took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with spices as a matter of the Jews is to bury. Are you cutting off the verse in mid-sentence? I think you are. You did it to me last time. But it's 41. See, this is what I get for condemning him for my mistakes. 41. 41. 
1940-41. You see, brother, I blame you for my mistakes because I'm a son of Adam. Son of Adam. You're lucky I love you and I pay you nothing for nothing. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulchre wherein was never yet laid. Now, when Jesus prayed to the Father that the cup be taken from him, Where was Jesus when he prayed to the Father that the cup be removed from him? In a garden, right? In a garden. Folks, I don't think you make the connection. Temptation came to the first couple in a garden. And death came to the first couple in a garden. The Son of God is now in a garden being tempted not to drink of the cup. And then he's laid in a tomb in a garden. <clears throat> and then he conquers the grave by rising out of that tomb in a garden. See the connection with the garden again? Temptation to sin and die <clears throat> came in a garden. Jesus is in a garden, tempted not to drink of the cup. He overcomes that temptation. And then he's laid in a tomb in a garden, and he conquers the grave. He conquers death. He destroys the power of the grave and death in a garden. Death in a garden, the destruction of death in a garden. <laughs> it's not a coincidence. It's a garden. Yeah. Right? Did you guys catch it? Temptation, sin, and death came in a garden. You have the Son of God, the second Adam, the last Adam, in a garden, <clears throat> facing <clears throat> the cup of God's wrath, something he dreads to drink. And he cries in a garden, if it's possible within your will, take it away from me. But I'm not insisting. Your will be done. And when the Father shows the Son, there is no other way for mankind to be saved but for you to drink the cup. He goes, then I really, I surrender <clears throat> and I accept your will. In a garden. Adam in a garden said to God, my will, not yours. The second Adam, the last Adam in a garden says, your will, not mine. As painful as it is, as dreadful as it is, your will, not mine. Adam in a perfect garden, when a perfect body and a perfect atmosphere succumbs to temptation. Jesus in a fallen world, imperfect world, surrounded by temptation and attacks of the enemy. And a less than ideal garden <clears throat> overcomes and submits to God's will. Death enters a garden, the destruction of death, <clears throat> the abolishment of death, the destruction of the grave also comes in a garden. I can't be loud, so this is why I'm speaking this way. If I sound monotone, bear with me because I did this impromptu and I don't want to disrespect my sister-in-law who's sleeping. Does everyone get it now? Did it make sense? Did it sink in? The first man, Adam, perfect world, perfect environment, perfect garden, plenty to eat, succumbed to temptation because of one tree that he didn't need to eat because he had plenty of trees to eat from and overabundance, a perfect body, perfect garden, a perfect world, and still failed. And told God, my will, not yours. The last Adam, the second man, Adam, in a fallen world, an imperfect world, a world that's demonized under the influence of Satan, and a less than ideal garden, says, your will, not mine. Death enters a garden. The destruction of death also <clears throat> comes from a garden.
Is that clear? I have no idea, Najem, what in the world you're talking about by trying to relate this to the yin and yang, a Chinese concept that's based on a completely different view of God, a view of God that is in opposition to the revelation of God and Jesus Christ. Only you could make a connection with yin and yang. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Exactly, Bill Thompson. And but not only that, Bill Thompson, let me make another connection. If you read the Old Testament, you'll find Israel often building altars in groves, in garden groves, performing sexual immoral acts and sacrifices to gods and goddesses in groves, in garden groves, all throughout the Old Testament. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? <clears throat> Garden groves, altars to false gods and goddesses, where they also commit lewd acts, sexual moral acts, <clears throat> in their worship of gods and goddesses. But anyway, I just wanted to give you that as a side point. Now, it's 81 minutes. I don't know. Do I have time? Let me see. Let me think about it. I think I should have a few more minutes. Okay. If you go back and listen to the first part of the session I did on the Christmas story, I talked about the star and what I believe the star was. Now, before I even do that, before I even do that, let's go to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 6. I may do a part 3. Buried on Jesus. I don't know what that means. Matthew 2, verse 1 to 6. I may do a part 3 on the star and the evidence for why I believe it's an angelic creature, a spirit being. But here, Matthew 2, verses 1 to 6. Matthew 2, verses 1 to 6. Let's read. If you want even more proof that the Magi knew that the Messiah is God in the flesh, Matthew 2, verses 1 to 6. Let's read. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men, the word is Magi in Greek, from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. I'll talk about the star and the third part of the fourth part. This is part three. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue to speak clearly without error and enable me to recall this information correctly in Jesus' name. Okay. I'll do a part three on the star, maybe Lord willing, Friday. Okay, but here, let's read. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. So the scribes, the scholars of the Old Testament, knew that the Old Testament prophesied the king of the Jews, the king of Israel, Israel's king, would be born in Bethlehem. How do they know it? Because they quote the prophecy. For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. This is a citation. And I don't know why the admins are slow in catching dogs and demons of the devil. You guys are really slow, man. Unbelievable how slow you guys are. I see them a mile away, and you guys are... All right. This is a prophecy of Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Let's go to Micah 5, verse 2. Micah 5, verse 2. Watch here. This is the prophecy, folks. The, the scholars of the Old Testament at the time of Jesus' birth pointed to this prophecy as prophesying the birthplace of the Messiah, the King of Israel, the King of the Jews, the King of creation. Now let's read the prophecy. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee 
shall he come forth unto me. Out of you, Bethlehem, will he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Now I want you to pay attention to the text. The King James perfectly translates the Hebrew, whose goings forth, goings forth, this is plural, goings forth, the Hebrew is plural, so they captured it perfectly, have been from of old, from everlasting. Wow. Wow. Did you see what God said to Micah and through Micah to the Jews? The rule of Israel will come out of Bethlehem. But let me tell you about him. His goings forth, his activities have been from of old, from everlasting. So here is the human ruler of the Jews who's actually from eternity. He comes forth from eternity, from everlasting. And his activities have been going on for quite a long time. So he's been active from the very beginning. He comes forth from everlasting, from eternity, has been active from the very beginning. And this one who's from eternity, who's an eternal figure, an eternal person from eternity, who's been quite active from the very beginning, he will become the human ruler of Israel. Wow. But now let's look at the context. Micah 5, verses 2 to 4. Let's look at the context by reading Micah 5, verse 2 again, but with 3 and 4. Okay, watch here. Micah 5, verses 2 to 4. Watch here. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now watch here. Therefore will he give them up. God will give up the Jews to captivity, to oppression, until the time that she which travaileth, she who is in labor pains and birth pains, hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren return unto the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed in the strength of Jehovah and the majesty of the name of Jehovah, his God. Hmm. Two distinct eternal figures, one of whom is born from a woman, a woman who gives birth to him in labor pains and birth pangs. So he is God who becomes human, and that God man is distinct from another who happens to be his God. And the majesty and name of the Lord is God, and they shall abide, for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. Hmm. Hmm. Wait, wait, wait. God is speaking about the ruler that will rule on his behalf, a ruler for me, a ruler over Israel. And this ruler I will summon out of Bethlehem. And the woman will, will be in labor pains, giving birth to him. So a woman gives birth to him in labor pains. So he's truly human. And as a human ruler of Israel, Jehovah is his God. But this human being comes forth from eternity, from everlasting, to be born of this woman, to be the human rule of Israel, but he's actually eternal by nature who becomes man. Wow. Did it make sense? Is it sinking in? Or no? Understand here, Micah prophesied the two natures of Messiah, that Messiah is eternal. He's an eternal person who comes from eternity, from everlasting, to be born of a woman who gives birth to him in labor pains. So he becomes the human ruler of Israel. So he's eternal. Therefore, he's God. But he's born from a woman. Therefore, he's man, the God man, the God man who rules Israel. And this is the prophecy that the scribes quoted to Herod and the presence of the wise men in Matthew 2. What? Did you hear what I just said? You hear what I just said? This is the prophecy that the scholars of the Old Testament quoted to Herod and the presence of the wise men in Matthew 2. 
verses 1 to 6, specifically 5 and 6. Did you catch it? The prophecy of Micah, which says, the ruler who rules on God's behalf, who rules over Israel, who is the Messiah, who is born of a woman who gives birth to him in labor pains so that he's an Israelite and he can rule his brothers and shepherd his brothers, his fellow Israelites, who are human like him. This human ruler will come forth from eternity to be born of this woman out of this place, to be the human ruler of his Israel, to be one with his brothers, the Israelites, because he shares in his humanity, but he's actually from eternity. Hmm. Sinking in? Now, I want you to do something. Here's the link to the interlinear Micah 5, verse 2. Click on it. Here's the link to the interlinear Micah 5, verse 2. Okay. King James perfectly rendered the Hebrew as goings forth because it's plural. Right? All right. Plural. Goings forth. Okay. Now, what does it mean whose goings forth have been from of old, from Qadim? Exactly superfluous. It's eternity entering time. You know what go his going forth have been from old means? You know what that Hebrew word means? Goings forth. Whose goings forth have been from old? Do you, you guys understand what that means? The word is used to imply activity. His activities. He's been active. His activities have been from old. He's been active from old. This isn't the first time right, that he's shown up. He's been showing up and doing things. His activities have been from of old. He comes from eternity, from everlasting, into time, and he's been doing things from the very beginning. He's been active from the very beginning. He's been there doing stuff from the very beginning. From the beginning of what? Do you see the word? Whose goings forth is of old. Do you see that word? Mi qaddam, mi qaddam or qaddim. You see that word? It's here. I'm going to. Mi qaddam, mi qaddam, mi qaddim, mi qaddam. However you want to pronounce the Hebrew. It's this word. Qaddam, qaddam, qaddim. Do you see that? You guys see that, right? Let me show you something. Let me blow your minds away. Get ready. So you guys don't think I'm making it up because I know how you are. Here is the link. Click here. Folks, that very word, miqaddam, miqaddim, is used to refer to the Garden of Eden. The Garden in the East in Eden. Go click on it. You'll see in Genesis 2a, Genesis 3.24, this very expression, miqaddam, is the word used to describe the location of the garden. The garden was in the east of Eden. Miqaddim of Eden. In other words, this is the one who's been there appearing even in the garden of Eden. There goes your proof, if you don't believe me. I just gave you the link. This same expression, Miqaddim, is used, and I just gave you the source, biblehub.com, the interlinear, Genesis 2, verse 8, and Genesis 3, verse 24. In other words, this ruler has been active from the time of the Garden of Eden. He was there actively involved in the Garden of Eden. He is the one who is the voice of Jehovah, who walked with Adam and Eve, the one who comes from eternity into time, whose activities have been from the very beginning all the way back in the Garden of Eden. John Doe, you know you're killing me too, right? 
Why do people ask me a question that I just answered? Right? You understand what Micah 5 2 is telling you? This human ruler whose mother birthed him in labor pains, who was born to be an Israelite, sharing in the human nature of the Israelites, making the Israelites his brothers. This human ruler, whom God summons to rule on his behalf, is an eternal figure who comes out of eternity, who's been active from the very beginning whose activities go as far back as the Garden of Eden. Do you understand who Jesus is now? And you see why he's born in Bethlehem, Ephrata, why he's born in Bethlehem, Ephrata? Because he is the eternal God the eternal one, this eternal person who comes forth from eternity, from the father himself, to be born of a woman, a woman who gives birth to him in labor pains, so he can be a flesh and blood Israelite, a flesh and blood Jew, making Israelites his brothers to rule over them, making the father his God by becoming man, but who is from eternity like the father is, and who has been active from the very beginning, whose activities go as far back as the Garden of Eden. That's who Jesus is, according to prophecy. Do you see how much meat is there in the Christmas story? Matthew 2 cites Micah 5 2, which is a prophecy of an eternal person, an eternal being an eternal one whose activities have been going on from the very beginning of creation, who's been actively involved all throughout the Old Testament, whose activities go as far back as the Garden of Eden. That one will then be born of a woman who gives birth to him in labor pains so he can share in the humanity of Israel, becoming an Israelite, making the Israelites his brothers, so he can rule over them as a human Israelite, who's more than human, who's from eternity, an eternal person, who's been actively involved throughout the Old Testament period, whose activities go as far back as the Garden of Eden. This one is God-man, God who becomes man, the God-man, one person, two natures, distinct from God the Father, Jehovah, who summons him to be ruler of Israel. Right? Now, God willing, if the Lord Jesus wills, Friday, I'll talk about who the star is what or who the star is what or who the star is now you guys not only hit the like button subscribe go back re-listen to this session and re-listen to the two previous sessions because this is now the third session i did on the christmas story specifically in matthew chapter 2. god willing lord jesus willing this friday i'll talk about who or what the star is and i'll finish the series on christmas right Yeah, it is, uh, Dusty. It's, it's, all of these videos are archived on my YouTube channel. Now, guys, have a very blessed Christmas. May the Lord Jesus reveal himself in an amazing supernatural way and more of himself to us in the upcoming year. May the Lord Jesus fill us more with his spirit. May he fill us more with his love, his compassion, his mercy, his boldness, his passion, his purity, his holiness. May the Lord Jesus fill us with wisdom and knowledge and understanding from the spirit and from the spirit to be caused to fall more passionate love with Jesus, to love him more, to trust in him more, to live for him more, to glorify him more and to preach his word without compromise and to give us a depth and understanding his word and having no doubt the Bible is his word and the God of the Bible is real and live out the Bible for his glory. May the Lord Jesus bless our loved ones. May he bless my daughters and flood them in his love and wash them in his blood and seal them by the spirit. And may the Lord Jesus transform me to become more like him and to use me more to bless you and love you for his sake in Jesus name. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. 
Jesus Christ is Yehovah to the glory of God the Father. Come, Lord Jesus, and cover us by your blood, and my daughters by your blood, and seal us by your spirit, and save us from Satan, the world, and from our flesh. We beg you and provide for us in Jesus' name. So, Lord willing, I'll see you Friday. Friday, I can be a little louder. Uh, pray again, guys, please. Pray that in the upcoming year, God will miraculously save me from the shackles of this corrupt, wicked, filthy judge, this tour of the devil. Set me free from the financial debt. Set me free. Give me financial freedom. Pray God will provide for me financially to get my own place because I can't stay here permanently and be a burden on anyone and to bring my daughters to me and to provide for me for my daughters. I need his provision for my daughters and to get on my own feet. And if you believe God has called me to full-time ministry, ask God to confirm that by bringing in the resources to do this for his glory because he doesn't need me. I need him. And if he's pleased to use me, amen. I want to be used for the glory of Christ till I die or until he comes. Again, I love you for the sake of Jesus. And more importantly, Jesus loves you and he's in love with you. And may we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be in love with him forever. We love you, Lord Jesus. God bless you guys. Don't forget to pray for my angels, my nine-year-old and seven-year-old. This is the third Christmas that I spent without them and I haven't heard from them. But I know Jesus loves them and he'll protect them. Hope you're blessed. I really hope you're blessed. If you were, if you were blessed, let me know so that I can be encouraged. I'm sorry, buffered again. It buffered again. Yep. I haven't seen my daughters since June and haven't been with them for Christmas. This is the third Christmas. Hope you're blessed in Jesus' name. Again, pray for me that God will confirm to me that he wants me to be used for his glory, to teach you. <clears throat> and to also do ministry for his glory. Praise, pray, and if you've been blessed, let me know by sending me a word <clears throat> that God has used me in your life for his glory because he doesn't need me, you don't need me, we need him. And in Jesus, we have everything. We love you, Lord Jesus, we love you, son of God. Take care, guys, gotta go.